Well, howdy and welcome everyone to yet another wonderful cloud native webinar. Uh, I'm here today with Jeff Kwan, Principal Software Engineer of Simpress, Nate Lee, VP of Sales and co-founder of SpeedScale, and I'm Taylor Dolezal, Head of Ecosystem here at the CNCF. Uh, today we're going to be talking about the topic of load testing and some things as it pertains to the technical issues and cultural issues as far as those topics. We're going to talk about the importance and challenges of load testing, uh, talk about some strategies and best practices, and then get into some innovations and what the future of load testing might look like. So with that, I uh, would like to welcome both of you to the virtual stage. Uh, Nate, Jeff, is there anything that you want to kick things off with? Any good mantras, quotes, uh, pieces of advice, or things that you found out recently? I'll let Jeff start. <laughs> um, that's mantras. Uh... Uh, I used to say this once to to um, an engineer, which was, I foresee increasing complexity. And, uh, and I think that <laughs> always uh, seems to work. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Nate? Yeah, no, uh, it's, uh, I think, I think a lot of the problems is, are quite complex to begin, right? And, um, you know, I, I think I've talked with the engineering teams before too. It's like, how do you eat the elephant? And it's always one bite at a time. Uh, so yeah, I think it's breaking it down into manageable sizes. I had a uh, really good mentor that always reminded folks that the time is always now, uh, which was also just a very, <laughs> a very great tongue in cheek thing, but, uh, <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Well, great to have you here today. Really excited to dig in and talk a little bit more about, uh, uh just all these complexities and what the load testing landscape looks like. I think as folks start to look at this wider landscape, um, or, or more and more people are starting to see that this is really important, right? This isn't something that makes sense to bolt on to the end of the process. It makes sense to really start thinking about from day one. And as you build out your APIs, construct your applications, et cetera, uh, some folks have shared about challenges as far as complexity or cost. Uh, do, do you have any thoughts on that front, Jeff, as far as uh, beginning to think about this or starting to rethink uh, how you how you think about load testing? Um, yeah, I think um, load testing is one of those things where I feel like um, it's like security. You know, you should always be thinking about it a little bit. Um, I think a lot of times we uh, wait too late. Um, oh, it's a couple, you know, months before and we have to do it now. Um, and so I think, you know, uh, one thing that, you know, load testing needs to be sort of brought to the forefront a little bit more. Um, and a lot of things that sort of also make things a little bit more difficult um, is that the landscape of, of a lot of our services have changed. Um, at uh, Simpress, we, we went from a, a monolithic system to you know a, a microservices um, based system. Uh, and you know how we load test it as a monolith is not how we load test as a set of microservices. That's a, that's a great point. And in, in terms of load tests, uh, are you able to share with how often you might go about doing that, or or kind of what that process looks like today uh, for you and your teams? Um, ideally, uh, we would like to do the load testing, you know, basically as part of our CI/CD pipeline. Um, we have started to introduce that um, as part of our process. Um, you know, most of our systems are still sort of manually um, tested um, in terms of load testing. Um, and so, you know, like we're moving in the direction of, of having it you know, fully automated um, so that, hey, you know, we can know when a change was made and everything on this particular endpoint is a lot slower. Gotcha, gotcha, that gotcha. That brings up an interesting point. Um, uh, if you don't mind me jumping in, Taylor, I uh, real curious. Please. Like, I think from the perspective of like wanting to automate load tests, it's it's quite a mature thing. Um, and I'm just curious about Simpress's journey. Um, it seems like a lot of organizations mark load testing as kind of like a nice to have, right? At what point did it become like a must have for Simpress? Um, so, so last year uh, we sort of did a um, we were at the end of a longish journey of microservices mm -hmm. migration. Um, and I think one of the, the critical things was, you know, 
so within um, Simpress, Vistaprint is is one of uh, is a company within Simpress, and uh, brand new microservices based architecture, um, and wanted to you know have confidence going into our first holiday season, and so so it was sort of like hey we got to do it now we need to know how it it's like, um, and so you know a couple of months before uh the it was you know wanted to know what what is the the state of our microservices the landscape in terms of load tech, like load throughput well, and yeah um and so you know that was the where the push came from mm. um and you know, it was actually very it was very nice because what happened was uh all all squads had to submit you know, uh, load testing plans, and then had to oh, wow. test them, and then had to share them, um, and and so you know, like it was, it, they, they were kind of agnostic in terms of what what tooling you used, but it was like, hey, please, pl please provide us some evidence that you've done this, and that you know, like you have some confidence in your own services. Yeah, I think that that's what we're seeing a lot as well is the, in, in terms of the landscape is like as these application architectures become more distributed, um, every API team kind of needs to do a little bit of due diligence. It's like, uh, can I what, what's what's my TPS, like my max like request per second I can do uh, with a monolith. It's kind of hard to point fingers or usually I think like the database team was always, you know, blamed. It's like, oh, it's probably the database, you know. Um, but now it's, it's like every API team, uh, can cause like cascading outages or latency or like the threads get held open. So it's, um, incumbent on those teams to basically say, oh yeah, I, I know I can do, you know, X, whatever. And, um, it's interesting. I think from a Simpress point of view, you, you folks are definitely ahead of the curve when engineering is already volunteering, like, Hey, we should probably, you know, <laughs> figure out what 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 our breaking point is before something bad happens. Yeah, I mean, it, in the model of culture, we definitely had a load testing sort of perspective. Oh, okay. Um, it was it, the, the type of tests because of the model it also did come from a central sort of perspective too. Mm -hmm. so like, um, and, and the testing styles were, were a, little, a little different um, in terms of how we accomplish load tests. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. I think that when it's it's really interesting to hear that, and I and I did like just the initial thoughts about uh, you know how do you eat the whole elephant one bite at a time. I think one I'd love to hear from you, Nate, and then go to you, Jeff, before moving on to our next topic. As far as teams tackling, starting to thinking about these things, did, have you seen more success with people just saying like, okay, low test everything, we're just going to go really deep into this, or have you seen more advantages with folks? Uh, identifying problem areas or brand new projects, maybe starting there, starting a little bit smaller, one one piece at a time. How do people uh, attack the elephant on that front? Yeah, I think um, the approach makes sense. Like, you know, in, in many technical things um, and many engineering leaders are already accustomed to the idea of like start small and prove it out and, and move bigger. But when it comes to load testing, that's easier said than done because um, just the other day, I was talking to, um, I think it was, it was a retail company. They were saying, oh, we do simple maths to figure out um, if we're going to scale. So we test on a tenth of the infrastructure. And then we assume that whatever throughput we do, we can do 10x of because it's a tenth of the infrastructure. And then I kind of joke like, well, in production, you know, theory tends to break down and nothing ever goes as expected in production. Uh and so what I'm trying to say is um, chunking things up when it comes to load testing is difficult. Like, how do I run 10x load without production scale infra? Um, and how do I um, run this comprehensive load test um, earlier in the life cycle without everyone being finished with their individual pieces of code, right? And so that gets that gets into like load testing getting delayed and pushed to the end of the SDLC and, and not running into... Um, uh, kind of like tenable timelines. It's like, oh, we got to get it out. Uh, and, 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 and in a full end-to-end -end environment, your mean time to figuring out, well, this is the cause of this delay. You find delay point one, delay point two, and then maybe that's all the time you have, right? Because it's, you know, uh, before you have to push out when really there's, you know, more severe delays. And so 
um, that's kind of uh, like, I think mocking plays a big piece in um, being able to isolate components and really um, doing more of like, what's like, what I think of as, as like a component level load test mm -hmm. that can really help shift left the, the component level load test. And I think is what a lot of retailers might be doing this holiday season to, to make sure at least they could start with their most critical APIs um, and, and isolate those. But um, the complexity nowadays, I, I, we were talking to, I forget, I think it was um, a venture capital firm doing like a tools landscape analysis, but he said the tools are necessary nowadays because the number of services people are building is too many for engineers to reason about. Like, it's just logically, it's like just too much for them to handle. Uh, and it's like, we can't expect engineers to know everything and all the connection points and all the schemas. It's just impossible now. It's uh, counterintuitive, but mocking is really polite to do when it comes to APIs. Great point on that front. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I haven't heard it as polite. I think maybe that may appeal to people's uh, ethical uh, side. It's like, come on, don't be rude. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, don't be rude. Mock me, please. Uh, <laughs> That's funny. Open API spec, probably. I'm going to go with uh, that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Jeff, what about you in terms of uh, dicing things up or factoring in those concerns with your teams, how, how, how have you seen success? Has it been kind of trying to tackle it within specific boundings or scopes or what, what's what's your secret to success there for Sempress? I, I do feel like definitely um, the, the mocking or the isolation really helps because we have, we did see instances last year where, you know, everyone, everyone's running lots of load tests and generating load throughout the entire ecosystem of services and that drives up the cost of, you know, like just running the services because things will scale up. Um, and uh, it, it gives you more confidence when you're able to sort of do it in isolation and go like, oh, hey, my, this service can take, um, you know, 5X load, right? Like I can give it 5X and, it'll perform the way that it still does. Um, and I can go, okay, well, that's good, next service. And then I can do that and repeat that. Um, and then I can get coverage, at least a sense of coverage amongst the services I have. And then you can start to do things like, okay, well, let's not mock this piece and then do the load and just verify. So it becomes kind of this, the, the slowly, you know, iteratively, um, you know, expanding the chunks and making sure that it's, that it's all working. Gotcha. Gotcha. Thank you. Really insightful. And I think that it's a, I know there's no one size fits all with every team. And so it's really interesting to see what folks do, um, you know, whether it's using something like speed scale to uh, have real, you know, as real as, as is possible data to be able to load test with uh, being able to record and then simulate some things like that really helpful. And then also having an understanding as far as where your bottlenecks are, whether that be your database, your your cache, or just even how your application is architected. So cool. Thank you. I, Thank you both so much. I had a quick question, if I may interject. Um, like real curious. Uh, I mean, Taylor, you've got an engineering background, and Jeff, you're hands-on keyboard engineering every day. Like when you hear the word mocking or stubbing, uh, what what is kind of the um, what what what's your what 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 sort of reputation does mocking and stubbing have? Um, I'm just curious as an aside. <laughs> I mean, I think I think the thing is that like classically it uh -huh. is um, thought of in the unit test world, right? When you're writing the unit test, uh, yeah. Um, but I think if we're looking at it from kind of looking at expanding it up on, into a service level, you're thinking about you know. Um, like, you know, it's like this classic black box sort of situation where mm. your inputs and your outputs to the, the service, which is the black box, are, you know, simulated, right? So you have you have the the input and output simulations. Um, and that, that's how I sort of view those those words. Got it. Yeah, when it comes to mocking for me, I think that there when I've implemented that or used that in the various teams and roles that I've had, it's 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 been mostly successful, but I do always kind of notice a, an ambivalence a little bit when starting with that because you're creating this perfect situation. And so a lot of folks are like, well, yeah, that, that's what's gonna happen, but in a perfect state or within a, that's a laboratory setting with no dust, 
once you get to the real world, we have no idea what might happen. The DNS records might be wrong. There might be a CPU that's tied up on 100%. There are those kinds of concerns that come into the mix, but not that it's, you know, not that that's enough reason to be like, never test. You know, yeah. I absolutely disagree with that. But I think that there is some, um, it's, it's a, it's good to be aware of that and, and see that as like, it's not a, a fail safe insurance uh, kind of policy or, or yeah. security policy on that front, but uh, definitely a great place to get started. Uh, even things like uh, mocking out different cloud APIs and things like that, just to make sure everything binds or works well together. And then you can start to build a little bit better tests and things around that nature too. So I see it as a necessary need on that path to cool. being able to have a more sustainable service. Yeah, that, that's kind of what I was actually, uh, it's it's funny because you use that word mock and I thought it might be good to spend a couple minutes on it. It's because it means so many different things to so many people. Um, like, you know, if you're using it for unit testing and then um, I've even gotten into some religious wars, like, well, that's not true unit testing. Unit testing shouldn't require any dependencies. So now you're functional testing and I didn't even want to touch that. Uh, but then um, I think for some people mocking, like you said, Taylor is like, well, it's not going to be real. And so then therefore I, I run into some situations where people are kind of throwing out the baby with the bathwater, so to speak, is like, it won't be real. So we might as well not do it. It's like, well, what if it covers 80% of the scenarios that you're running into? It's still better than nothing, right? So I don't think you should kind of totally discount it. And then there's some prevailing, I think, um, uh, bad reputations from the past where it's like most mocking tools require a lot of scripting and it's they're very brittle, like they return, you know, five every time. Uh, and so it's like, well, now I need it to return six. I have to go in there and hard code six. And mm -hmm. so it's got a bad rap in some ways as well. Um, and so that anyways, was just curious it, it, what you what you guys think uh, echoes a lot of what I, I've, I think I've heard across the board from people. But um, yeah, I think modernizing mocks in a way that it works for microservices could be a game changer. Yeah. Agreed. Agreed. I think knowing where those strengths and weaknesses lie, just as far as how to layer your stack and that testability or working with your SRE or platform teams is, is really important. I think on, on that topic, um, I, I do want to focus a little bit more on uh, specific holiday seasons, things like Black Friday or Christmas or the holiday season, those kinds of sales and in taking a look at what that means uh, for you know what you see at speed scale as far as folks testing on that front and what Simpress goes through as far as dealing with that. Um, I am really keen to hear on some of the big mistakes or things that you think that people should be doing that most folks uh, aren't taking uh, into account and how to better set up load testing and setting up their strategy as we get into things like, like the holiday season. Um, I would love to kick things off with you, Jeff, uh, and hear about some of your learnings and things that you think more folks could be working on. Um, I think one of the things, again, back going back to sort of thinking about load testing as a constant concern, um, but even if you don't, uh, you know, pretty much even after holidays over, um, there's basically, you have one year to repair again. Mm -hmm. um, and so sort of, uh, the, there isn't really, don't think of it as, a, as you know, a season. There, the whole year is the entire season to prepare. Um, and so, you know, we, uh, we, we typically kind of bear down closer to like, you know, July and August is sort of when we sort of ramp up and think about, about the load testing thing again. Uh, but honestly, like we are moving towards trying to have that load testing mindset constantly. Um, and so, you know, one of the things that we we need to think about um, is with with load tests, um, especially for holiday season, uh, you know, be very mindful of what the data might be, um, because you know your traffic today might not be the same as the traffic during holiday. Um, and so that's sort of some of the things that we think about a little bit. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, one of the other things that we also think about is uh, sort of getting a baseline um, for critical services. So understanding like, you know, this application here, um, you know, made it through holiday and, but we, you know, we load tested it, it can handle 5K sessions. Um, let's say we need, you know, like next holiday, maybe we'll, we'll be double. So 
we need to make sure it handles 10k sessions and that sort of that planning starts in in january or february and you know, because not all these things can be done overnight and so sort of thinking about it early planning for the architectural changes thinking about like oh hey we need to add caching to this one add caching to that one um that's the sort of you know things to sort of help plan ahead so that you know when you start to really hit the load tests in september you're not going to see any, you know, any any last minute changes you might have to put in. Great point. Great point. I think that I, I've heard from folks, uh, certain end users within the CNCF, uh, some that may or may not be involved with the tax season, and everybody files those way ahead of time, right? Um, so, <laughs> so <laughs> it's I've heard some really good stories about, uh, you know, hitting this this incredible amount of load and. That's a good problem to have, but you don't want folks to go down, right? You don't want to have those experiences. I think, Nate, my, my question to you is, as we see things like modern scalability and, and things of that nature, I, I like what Jeff said about maintaining a baseline and getting a good understanding as to what traffic you might see, you know, setting, setting the correct expectation. When it comes to being able, you know, having these things like Fargate and other technologies that allow for this maximum scale, what are your thoughts? Does that mean that people are in, indefinitely safe, that they shouldn't need to, to load test? Uh, it's a loaded question, of course. Yeah, no, that, that was definitely the, <laughs> the kind of the promise of cloud was like, oh, we're, we're ephemeral and we're self-healing and we're auto-scaling and all the buzzwords. Um, and, uh, you know, e even the basic premise of cloud, like only on when you need it. Um, um, and, and it, oh, it's going to save you money. And that was supposed to be such a big departure from VMs. Uh, but then I already see people doing the same thing they did with VMs, which is, hey, who's using this instance? I don't know. Let's turn it off and see who complains <laughs> kind of thing. You know, that's how you can tell. And if nobody I've complains, never done that. Using yeah. It. Yeah. <laughs> um, and that still happens in cloud, right? Um, and so taking that step of, uh, a step further, like I think there's like circuit breaker patterns and load balancers and people think it's kind of the end all be all. And it can help to mask some problems. Um, but, you know, for example, in Kubernetes, I believe if, if you're CPU bound, like it can take down and cause like cluster wide issues. Right. And so it's not actually um, a problem. I think I read an Airbnb case study, which is public, where. Um, they upgraded Java and it was causing some memory issues, but because they were auto scaling, um, they just kept adding more and more and more pods and they didn't realize until they got like a five or six figure AWS bill. And then they realized, oh, we've got, we made some code changes and we upgraded Java and memory wasn't getting allocated like we thought it was. Instead, we were just spinning up more pods. And so um, all that to say, I think people can have a false sense of comfort and, and there's still a lot of kind of optimizations and cloud savings that can take place, which I know is, is popular with everyone um, trying to kind of count their pennies um, nowadays. Um, and then, you know, my takeaway with what Jeff said um, uh, with looking at traffic and stuff like that is like, listen, you don't have to be the, the best, uh, you know, performance testing, performance engineering organization on day one. You can really take a look at kind of the 80-20 of like, you know, what's the most likely stuff that's gonna get hammered and what are the most common use path, use cases or, 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 or user journeys? Let's start load testing that. And like, you know, hey, we may not be able to get to everything, but every little like, you know, um, major shopping flow that we could take off the table and, and, and be kind of safer about is still less risk we're exposing ourselves to. Um, and I, it, it's it's hard to do, and I don't think anybody ever really feels like the job is done. But um, you know, it, it, it's progress. Yeah, I, I think I think most engineers can kind of tell you, hey, if I ask you, what is the service that will keep you up at night, right? Mm -hmm. like, what, yeah. what are the ones that that keep you up at night? Um, and, and you know, those are the ones you want to you want to do do first, right? Uh -huh. Like, you know, like, oh, that one, no, I don't know, you know, like, and, and that that's that's exactly you know, like. Target those. You'll you have a good sense of what those are. I hope. Is is that how you folks kind of got started when when you were like is it as a like yeah which where do we get started with load testing which service should we start yeah with? that that's how I start I mean, mm -hmm. I mean in terms of like prioritization I'll, I'll do this one first this one the first this one first you know like nobody can check out if this one doesn't work oh right? yeah right and you know that's simple mm -hmm. um, and and that kind of go down that list like oh yeah you know it's going to be degraded experience if you don't get to this one but you know like it's not you know like it's not going to keep me up super, super late at night. <laughs> <laughs>
when it, when it comes to developing that practice and just the, those overall behaviors, Jeff, I think was there was there a formative or pivotal moment for you that made you really focus uh, on uh, being able to load test and to scale appropriately and get the right tooling and culture set up? Was it was it an outage that that got you really convinced on this front, or was it something that you just kind of noticed over time? I'd, I'd love to hear about your story there, um, and then go to you Nate in a different capacity. I, I think I think it's something that um, you know I. I one of the practices that uh, we had at, at Vistaprint was um, people would become problem managers. So they take a rotation mm-hmm. of being on call. So when you kind of are on call, you get really a good sense of what happens when systems go down. And so you kind of get this urgency factor in your head that, hey, you know, like I have to worry about this particular thing a little bit more because that's my service. And if my service goes down, then other things, other bad things happen. People get woken up. Right. And so you don't want to get woken up. Right. <laughs> I think that's the, that's where the, that's where the sort of like, the, that's how I sort of built over time like this. Okay. Well, will this wake me up? Will someone page me when this goes down? Like, and, and so you get that sense of like what to do um, to, to protect yourself from getting that 3 a.m. call. Right. <laughs> It's uh, the the pain of being woken up is a very good motivator. I uh, I'm very happy to be in a role now where I don't have to monitor pager duty. Uh, so <laughs> I, I know that pain very much. Uh, uh, yeah, I'd much rather read something like Good Night Moon or listen to an Audible book uh, <laughs> between between you and me. Uh, <laughs> Nate, being on the other side of this, you know, being VP of Sales and and being the co-founder of of SpeedScale. Um, you know, I, I feel like that's really a, a, an important distinction because you saw this pain point that many folks had. What inspired you to go forth and, and create this company uh, that focuses on these items? And then are there any interesting things that you're seeing right now, too, on that front in terms of adoption or more of a focus on, on this kind of testability? Yeah, no, I mean, great question. I mean, real briefly, like I was in sales engineering for like DevOps tools um, and then ended up becoming a product manager. So I had my own engineering backlog and kind of uptime SLAs as well. And then um, the most recent role I had was actually doing digital transformation, like consulting for a lot of these Fortune 500s, like banks, credit card companies, um, e-commerce companies. And uh, what my co-founders and I realized, um, and, and they're from observability background, like New Relic and, uh, and Observe, is that a lot of these companies don't know what a kind of an unlocker, a velocity unlocker um, mocking can be, uh, enabling parallel development, allowing you to get around restrictions. And pr- it's predominantly because most of the mocking tools out there are um, open source script-based mocking tools. And uh, they have their time and place. I'm not knocking those at all, um, but they can be a little bit brittle and um, kind of slow to develop. And so we didn't have a solution when we started SpeedScale. We were like, how can we make this easier? Um, and so that's when we came up with the concept of like traffic-based mocks. Like what if we model the behavior of the mock from traffic and there's an abundance of it um, and it can be much more realistic generated in minutes. Um, and then of course, the other, the other side effect was, yeah, we were feeling the pain like Jeff was. Like, I think um, my co-founder, Ken's got a story of like seeing all these alerts happen and there's a big streaming event happening and he's pulling his hair out um, and the, uh, the monitoring alerts are going off. And if anybody, you know, having been an SRE tailor, <laughs> it's like you're seeing those dashboards. It's like, let's, let's try <laughs> to figure this out beforehand next time instead of, you know, uh, during the day of the sale or the streaming event or you know, the reservation day, um, it it can really um, kind of drive the point home. But it's easier said than done when you're saying like, let's make sure we know our throughput capacities and such. And so that's where we were like, let's let's build up the tooling to allow you to simulate what's going to happen. Because at the end of the day, everything engineering and devs do is to prepare for that, the live game day, right? and uh, and then you know I, I hate using the term because it's so overused, but shift like like shift left. If you can bring those conditions sooner, then I can run through those scenarios and get a better sense of like, am I ready or not, or should we you know over provision a little bit here? Should we optimize the code there, kind of thing? Cool, cool. No, thank you so much for that. I think that that's really insightful to see how uh, it's it just life is kind of transformed and those concerns and that fact of we we don't have to do it the hard way anymore to 
as an additional note for anyone looking to join the SRE path as far as their career, if you really like the color green and even like the color red that much more, great, great job role for you. <laughs> it has nothing to do with Christmas, you'll find out. Yeah, uh, <laughs> it's funny. Uh, I'm, I'm curious to move into our next topic and talk about uh, three things that you, you want to do now and, and kind of like really digging into the future of uh, load testing at scale and some of the things that you have as far as your, your personal candid insights on that front. I think, um, Jeff, I'd love to start with you and talk about your experience and uh, how you've changed your approach to testing uh, as time has gone on. Uh, any uh, any insights there? Um, let's see, my approach to testing has sort of, has changed a bit. Um, I think, you know, if I were to dial back, like, Five or six years ago, um, you know, we were using open source tools. We were using, you know, some of us actually in the company, you know, did some uh, homegrown tools, um, and you know, trying to do load testing um, was sort of tough. It was tough because uh, the expertise on using the tools, you know, it was very only sat in a very few number of people because it wasn't something we always did, it wasn't something on top of mind. So, you know, I was the one who was wrangling the tools together and I was the one who was um, trying to get, you know, uh, you know, SSH into boxes to load the tools on or run the tests. Um, and, and sort of the journey now is like, hey, you know, what is the, what, what is the easiest tool to pick um, to, so that, you know, I can get, my entire team to do to do the the work right like to do the load testing um to do it on their local machine um and i think that 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 is the sort of like um you know how can we move from scripted manual process that um you know only a few people know how to do to sort of a documented um automated both documented and automated process that you know is done all the time um and you know, I think that that sort of um, and and automating a lot of that too, um, and so you know, the, the that's sort of where we are in the you know the journey. We we are moving towards automation. Um, we're we're not quite there yet, completely automated, um, but you know we we are getting really close. And I think um, I'm excited to see us move in that direction too. And and I, I've I've seen similar things in my career as well, kind of. Starting with those initial uh, scripts, would it, was it? I think there was like Apache. Um, uh, I can't remember if it was Gun or, or there. There's a lot of like Gun Drill, all those types of things too. There was Bumblebees, which would yeah, um, you know, spin up Lambda scripts and like really, really go after something. I, I've been really interested in in tools like Hey and K6 and Speed Scale uh, uh, on those fronts as well. So I think that I agree. It's been a difficult kind of. Uh, it, difficult path in terms of being able to string these things together. We have a lot more support for orchestrators and observability and telemetry. But when it comes to actually delivering this load, you, a lot of cases and times you'd have to go and work at an Airbnb or an Intuit or a Mercedes or an Apple or th those kinds of companies to be able to experience this. There wasn't really that uh, an use case, unfortunately. You know, you had to be sitting in the seat. Uh, being woken up at 3 a.m. In, <laughs> in many cases, which is really unfortunate. So I like seeing that there's more comprehensive test suites and this ability to uh, have this, this amount of load simulated, especially with real traffic too. I think that as time goes on, I'm kind of curious to see if we're going to have more data sets available to us that we could simulate um, you know, similar types of load or be able to generate uh, types of uh, load tests for our specific applications and then pair that with our API interfaces, things of that nature. Uh, Nate, I uh, would love to hear from you on that front, just kind of what your, your overall journey has been and then what you think the future is going to be uh, for load testing. Yeah, um, I mean, I think it's, it's, it, it mirrors a lot of what Jeff was saying, but, you know, I've typically been on the vendor side of things, uh, for better or for worse, um, but it, it did afford me the opportunity to go into a lot of these different companies and see how they do or, more importantly, don't uh, test. Um, and uh, it's not for lack of trying. I mean, really, I think like a lot of the 
folks in like the QA, which traditionally known as a QA space has been gobbled up by, you know, these larger enterprises and then kind of driven into the ground. Um, uh, apologies for being frank. Uh, so a lot of these open source tools have actually kind of risen to the task. Um, but really what we were looking at was like, how do we automate the automation? Um, and, and I know it, it sounds strange, but it's something that like when we were doing user interviews, building speed scale, it's like what the engineering leaders were really kind of concerned with is we can't, we just can't keep up. We're getting run ragged and, um, you know, the business is always going to want to, uh, push features out the door, then like address technical debt. Um, but it's a serious problem that really keeps us up at night. Um, and, uh, when we're automating the automation, we knew a key piece that had to come with it was not only the test drivers or the load drivers, but also the environment management, which is why we took the traffic-based approach um, because the traffic will allow you to develop the tests and allow you to develop the mocks, which kind of addresses the environment constraint. Because without the environment to run the tests in, and this is something I saw in my consulting background is you're kind of still at the same point stuck you know it's like um but i think it's a journey for everyone um i think starting there's nothing wrong starting with open source tooling and and kind of figuring out like here's the test drivers and here's kind of the environment or mocking tools but i would like um strongly urge uh whoever's you know it, when when you're starting out on this journey to totally think about the 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 test driver and the environment piece in tandem. Um, now, the hard part is is the glue, right, of, of putting all that all together um, within whatever you know GitHub Actions or Jenkins or Circle CI orchestration you're going to do. Um, and uh, um, it, it's once you kind of struggle through that, I think you have a good picture. Like Taylor, you were saying, like at Uber or Disney or, or where have you. Um, that's really when you kind of figure out, okay, well, this is what I want in a perfect world, and then you know. 2.0 of your testing framework becomes that much better. Yeah. One other thing I'd like to add is I think for me, the greatest confidence always came from um, using real data, like using, mm -hmm. um, you know, and I've had only had it. There's only a couple tools that will help with capturing real data so that you can replay it. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think, you know, I always, whenever I had that situation, I felt much more confident in the results and where I was, where, you know, where the, the application's at, like the state of it. I, I agree. I feel like it's it's great to see folks start with mocks and some open source tooling and then just kind of like get a feel for things, understand the why behind it is what they do. And then again, that mock, that's that perfect dust-free environment kind of scenario. But I, I'm I'm really optimistic for seeing real data and then you know de-identified, anonymized, just kind of like safely processed and handled data on that front to be able to simulate a lot of that load for folks. I, I completely agree that I feel like that brings the confidence up. It's it's uh, gritty, just like the real world. And then we can actually make some, uh, we can see things that we never expected to see in, in a lot of cases too, as we go and test and, and kind of work through these things. But uh, I, I awesome. want to add a couple like amusing antidotes that uh, like we, or antidotes, anecdotes, sorry, my kid was in the, uh, went to the doctor, so I'm in the wrong mindset. <laughs> um, but uh, <laughs> Uh, well, although maybe this is an, an antidote, but um, uh, like for example, the real data is always kind of surprising, and we're we're always kind of amused by what happens. Um, you know, for example, uh, like um, systems that have erroneous conditions, um, but are still sending back uh, "I'm healthy" health check uh, mm -hmm. back to the load balancer. Like that, that could actually happen. Um, or people expecting um, shopping patterns, like if there's a sale that happens. And you expect everybody to start perusing and looking at the product indexes and then like, you know, the product detail pages and then checking out, right? That's how you'd expect the flow to go. But um, maybe um, everybody does the shopping the night before. And then everybody, during, when the sale happens, actually I do this is like, I've already got my address and my credit card information entered. And when the sale goes live, I just click checkout. And so mm. now it's like, people aren't hammering the product index page like you expected. Everybody's just hammering the checkout API and the load pattern doesn't go like this. It goes straight up, <laughs> it goes across, right? <laughs> and so looking at real traffic patterns to understand like how should I um, test realistically, I think is gonna be more and more of a, a, an important factor which, and which is why we're indexing so hard on like using real 
uh, de-identified, of course, traffic. Um, I think, yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, that's a great point. And yeah, I, it's, it's, what is it? Life imitates art, not the other way around. Uh, same thing with checkout pages. Yeah. Never what you'd expect. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you so much uh, both for for joining today. Uh, I sincerely could keep this conversation going for hours. I really loved your insights and uh, still tends to talk about. So I'll I'll be in touch. We'll have some popcorn chats and things like that about that after the fact. Um, uh, Yeah, thank you for your insights on load testing and and all of those strategies and stories. I think as we conclude, we'd love to urge everybody to continue their thinking, reflecting, and learning on those lessons and sharing with others. Because uh, I think that that's, uh, we, we want to hear your stories. We want to hear about how you're going about thinking about these things. Uh, yeah, thank you so much, everybody. Uh, with that, I know that I had you open, but definitely would like to invite you to close too. Jeff, would love to hear any closing thoughts from you. And then uh, Nate, uh, if you wouldn't mind rounding us out before I, I say some final words. Um. Yeah, final words. I think, um, yeah, getting that that load testing in the culture, I think, is very important. Um, and I think it 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 definitely pays dividends for for the uh, squads and the teams that think about it, um, because then it's not a fire drill. And 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 you can it's very easily explained to um, to other people on management, uh, other engineers, like, hey, here's what we're doing, and it's you know, like, I have confidence. You know, like I think that that definitely helps build confidence within the squad, um, within the teams. Um, but yeah, I, I I think definitely getting this on top of mind for a lot of engineers, would, you know, helps everybody. It helps, you know. Yeah. Great. And for me, I think um, just to piggyback on what Jeff said is like, um, yeah, performance is becoming more and more critical. And um, you don't have to think about it as a discipline you have to jump into immediately and be the master of. Mm-hmm. I think, like Jeff was saying, start with the most critical ones, um, the most like, uh, you know, um, kind of centerpiece services that you have and um, think of driving load into that service and then isolating the environment for it or building a mini environment for it. And that's just a much more manageable problem than how do I become, you know, the, the, the gift to load testing. <laughs> Agreed. Agreed. I think it'll be an interesting time seeing this get automated and, and getting more data on that front too. Uh, when not only we have to fill out performance reviews, but when we see our services do that too, it's going to be a very, very interesting times. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you both so much uh, for folks interested uh, in uh, checking out Simpress's checkout page, uh, please check out simpress.com, C-I-M-P-R-E-S-S.com. And if you want to drive some traffic to your applications and get things tested, uh, please check out SpeedScale, which is speedscale, all one word, dot com. Uh, and I'm sure both folks would love to have you introspect their services and make sure everything's looking good as far as their product pages and everything else go. Uh, until our next webinar, stay curious, keep exploring possibilities. Thank you and take care, everyone. Have a good one.